today, what I'm going to talk to you about is how viruses avoid the host that they populate. And for those of you who know who Satchel Page is, very famous um, black pitcher who pitched for about three years in the major leagues but spent most of his time in the Negro League, he had this famous saying, don't look back because something might be gaining on you. And that's really the philosophy of what we'll be talking about today. So, questions that we have to address are, what happens when a virus invades a host, and what does one do to the other? And it's a battle. And sometimes the virus wins, and sometimes the host wins. More often than not, in the initial rounds of infection, the virus is dominant. But at later times, the host, with its adaptive uh, immune system and its innate immune system, managed to eke out some level of survival. So for the virus, what are its goals? Its goals are survival. And what does that mean? It means that it either wants to, well, it doesn't, doesn't really want to, but it either reproduces and releases new virus particles, or in another manifestation of infection, it allows, or it is allowed to persist in the host and become a lifelong companion, sometimes with serious sequelae, sometimes with none that are obvious. And we'll talk about some of these on Wednesday. So, what are the strategies for evasion? Obviously, the best strategy is just to overwhelm the host. And that allows for reproduction of large numbers of virus particles. And it also, of course, permits the virus to go find another place to live. Unfortunately, it also kills the host. And when that happens, um, sometimes it's not easy for the virus to find a new place to lodge itself. One of the best ways a virus can avoid the host is to enter parenterally. And that means any way other than through the gut. Why? Because there are only a few viruses that are capable of surviving well within the gut, those without envelopes. And even some of the viruses that don't have envelopes have problems surviving in the acidic environment of the stomach, all of the mucus, the large number of bacteria that is secreting proteases, and the innate immune system, which works very effectively in the gut. So that's why. And what's the mission of the virus? The virus's mission is to disarm the host. And it has many different ways of doing this. And we'll talk about them in terms of things like autophagy, the cell response. We'll talk about them in terms of apoptosis, another cell response. We'll talk about them in terms of the innate immune system and how viruses abrogate the host's attempts to stop them, and also in terms of the adaptive immune response, specifically with regard to how uh, virus antigens are um, presented and how cells recognize virus-infected uh, cells. So uh, there's a lot to cover, and I'm going to begin, to some extent, with talking to you about what goes on during an infection, a little bit of immunology for those of you who haven't had it, it's probably going to become, unfortunately, important for you to pay attention to that part of the lecture. But we'll get on with it um, as we see fit. So what goes on during an acute infection? One which results in reproduction of virus and illness to the host. Virus comes in. And here's our virus growth curve, if you will. And it triggers the innate defenses. And that triggering requires some sort of threshold of virus response. And the virus getting in, either um, expressing PAMPs or expressing double-stranded RNAs as a result of transcription and triggering the innate defense. And all during this period of time, the virus is growing. And at some point, it triggers the innate immune response, the adaptive, excuse me, the adaptive response. So what you see here is the host beginning to respond, but infection has already started. So the virus is doing what it wants to do. So actually, when do you treat somebody? Unfortunately, you treat them before you know they're infected. Because for the most part, once you intercede at this point, the virus has done what it's going to do. The host has begun to respond. And most, path most pathogenesis results from virus-inducing um, host responses, cytokines, um, complement killing cells, cell necrosis. So, you begin to see symptoms after the virus has reached its peak titer. The adaptive response, response uh, initiates. 
And the most important part for the host is that virus is cleared and memory is established. So there are two aspects of memory, T cell memory, and that's the antibody response, and T cell memory, and that's the cell mediated response. So those things occur, and they can last for about 50 years, or at least that's what we believe. And we believe that based on the fact that older people, like me, tend to get infections that they had again when they were young. So you go through a period of 50 years, and you have uh, some resistance to many different viruses and uh, bacteria, whatever, and unless they're constantly being reinforced, uh, the memory cells run out. So what happens when the virus meets the host? The pathogen comes in, the pattern recognition receptors respond, they see the path pathogen, they elicit dendritic cells to come to an area where the virus is, cytokines are released, the complement cascade is initiated, all things that Dr. Racaniello has told you about, and this is the first line of defense, the innate response. In response to the innate response, more cytokines are elicited, dendritic cells now present antigens to other cells, and we begin to develop the adaptive immune response. Along with this is the generation of what are called natural killer cells. And these are cells that uh, recognize uh, infected cells when major histocompatibility uh, complexes are present on their surface. So what happens is the adaptive immune response, response evaluates pathogen structure, and it fine-tunes recognition. And then we get clonal expansion of B and T cells. So you have to go through all these steps, recognition, activation, and then clonal expansion, and then we have uh, memory cells that are generated. How does the virus avoid these? Well, many viruses elicit proteins that are called vipers. And these are proteins that interfere with antigen presentation in one way, shape, or form. And their purpose is to disarm innate immunity, find some way to counter some of <coughs> the aspects of the innate immune response, to regulate MHC molecules. And these are the molecules that are responsible for antigen presentation. They come in two flavors, MHC1 and MHC2. And each of these are recognized to some extent, more or less, by CD4 positive or CD8 positive cells. And we'll talk about what viruses do to regulate these molecules. And I think you'll find that that's really quite amazing. They alter antigen presentation. That is the way antigens are normally placed on the surface of cells. They can interfere with cytotoxic T cells. And these are cells that are designed to identify, rapidly identify cells that are infected and lyse them. And they interfere with the natural killer cells, a different breed of T cell. And finally, they can go and hide. So they become part and parcel of you, sometimes your genome sometimes extra chromosomally, and we'll discuss this in much greater detail on Wednesday. The host defenses, as I've begun to tell you about, are the innate immune response, and you've heard about that. That seems to respond to everything. There are 11 different kinds of toll receptors, and there are also other innate molecules that are present within the cell, and some of them govern intranuclear modulatory molecules, and things that we talked about earlier when we talked about DNA replication in cells. And I told you that there were viral factories that were established in the nucleus, and that these were established at sites called ND10s, or nuclear domain 10. And there is a large um, battery of proteins that constitute this uh, innate response, and I'll give you a short example of that in a bit. The immune system recognizes a signal, and that's a virus infection an antigen, it can be something that's processed as a result of the virus entering the cell, or something that's processed because the virus is making a new protein. And that's the difference between MHC1 and MHC2, and we'll go into that in a bit more detail later. It then goes ahead and amplifies this signal. And amplification by the host results from cells being activated. And once cells are activated, they home to specific sites where they can be amplified. That is, they, they uh, 
divide and they provide new cells, such as more plasma cells to make more antibody, or more T cells to go out and uh, conquer the invader. Dr. Racaniello has told you about interferons and how interferons re induce an antiviral state. And I'm going to focus on this molecule, protein kinase R, and demonstrate several ways in which viruses actually abrogate the action of this molecule. He's told you that complement punches holes in membranes, and if you punch a hole in an infected cell, then that cell will be triggered to apoptose. All of its fluids will leak out. The virus is no longer in a safe milieu, and it will not have the ability to replicate. Again, natural killer cells and cytotoxic T lymphocytes. And finally, cells that just go ahead and gobble up everything in their pathway, macrophages and neutrophils. So they can eat viruses that are infecting us. The adaptive immune response is much more complex. It's a memory response, or it can become a memory response. It's activated in response to the innate immune system. So things don't just happen on their own. You have to trigger innate immunity in order to activate cytokine release. And it's the cytokines that are released from infected cells that result in clonal expansion and recognition of B and T cells. And clonal expansion of B and T cells requires CD4 positive Th1 cells, so those are T helper cells. They elaborate a specific, specific family of cytokines, and Th2 cells, and they elaborate a different family of uh, cytokines. And of course, there is some over overlap because it's biology and nothing is exact. We get generation of cytotoxic T cells, which are CD8 positive cells, and antibody production. And both of these require elicitation of cytokines from Th1 and Th2 cells. We also have an inflammatory <coughs> response. And this is uh, in response to necrosis, in response to cell death, but not apoptosis. And it results in releases of cytokines and chemokines. And you've heard of cytokine storms. And cytokine storms result from the inflammatory response. And this is an over-response to an infection, be it either bacterial or viral, where hundreds and thousands of T cells come in and elaborate cytokines and chemokines. And that results in bringing in more cell inflammation, and it can lead to um, drastic consequences to the host. These also recruit neutrophils and macrophages to the site of damage. Why? Because as I told you before, these cells are very busy gobbling up debris. And when they clean up debris, they keep it from activating other cell types. I told you that cytokines are the primary output of the innate immune response. And what they provide is a rapid response. So they're like uh, the firemen coming quickly to put out the fire. And sometimes that works very efficiently. It recruits more cells to the site of infection. And these cells can go ahead and do whatever it is that they're going to do, either um, gobble up debris, take up infected cells and kill them, take up free virus. They also control inflammation. So cytokines can be good and they can be bad. Too much of a good thing results in something that's bad and you don't control the inflammation. They induce it the antiviral state. That is, they cause cells to synthesize interferons. And in response to interferons, we make interferon, we activate interferon-stimulated genes, or ISGs. And most importantly, for the purpose of today's talk, is that they regulate the immune system, both B cell and T cell responses. So, the virus, of course, has to have a response to all of this. And its first response is to make virokines. And um, virokines are just like chemokines or cytokines, except they're, they are encoded by virus genes. Some of them are so much like the host that it's clear that they were stolen from the host. And these mimetics bind and sequester host receptor molecules. So, a receptor on a cell that sees a virokine will bind that virokine, 
things to chemotize. But the binding is not a legitimate event. And instead of seeing signal transduction through the membrane and activation of the cell, that doesn't happen. And those cells, those infected cells, are now hidden. They're mass. Viruses also make their own receptors, or receptor-like molecules, phyroreceptors. And these can be soluble chemokine receptors, or cytokine receptors. So the virus now has a gene that encodes a molecule that acts just like the receptor. It binds host cytokines. But it binds them usually out in uh, the free milieu. So it's not when they're attached to cells, although it's clear that there are also uh, viral receptors that embed themselves in the membrane of cells. But if you soak up the soluble cytokines, then they can't effectively do what they're there to do. They can't activate cells, so there's no response. So in this way, they divert cytokines from initiating a response. And that's a pretty good mechanism to help keep things down and allow the virus to replicate in situ. They sabotage both innate and adaptive defense without affecting growth in cell culture. And that, of course, is one of the things that we always uh, talk about, because we tend to study viruses in cell culture. And that's really in absentia, if you will. It's not the host. It doesn't have the same kind of response. And even when you take T or B cells and you infect them or you expose them to infected cells, you don't have all of the responding molecules or cells, so you frequently can't um, figure out exactly what's going on. Now, what are some of the products of counter-interferon? You've heard Dr. Racaniello tell you that there are hundreds of genes that are turned on in response to interferon. And there are several different kinds of interferons. And if a virus can get around that problem, and that is abrogate the host interferon response, then the host has a limited ability to contain the virus infection. How do they do it? Well, some viruses, such as influenza, pox viruses, and herpes simplex virus, elaborate binding proteins. So these are proteins that bind double-stranded RNA. And if you bind double-stranded RNA, you mask it from being uh, an activator of Rig I or MDA5. Adenovirus elaborates a double-stranded RNA molecule, which acts as a decoy. So this double-stranded RNA interacts with PKR, and once it interacts with PKR, it prevents PKR from shutting down the translational apparatus of the host. So here we can think about this as an RNA molecule and a protein molecule, or molecule, each of which does something different. So uh, this is meant not to overwhelm you, but merely to demonstrate the many different ways in which the interferon response can be modulated. And I think that it's um, important to illustrate, to illustrate the fact that you can actually just inhibit interferon synthesis. And there are hosts of virus proteins that do that. You can have interferon receptor decoys, as I told you before. So these are virus receptors, and they can soak up interferon that's present uh, or being elaborated in an infected cell. You can inhibit the signaling, so that binding to its appropriate receptors on the surface of cells. And you can block the function of interferon-induced proteins. And there are many different ways in which this occurs, and it's um, an interesting thing to study. So what are some of the regulators of interferon-stimulated genes? Let's talk first about um, ND10s, because I've discussed those before with regard to DNA replication and transcription. And I told you that they're a composition of complex host proteins, and they repress virus replication. But viruses come in and overwhelm that system and take it over. And they use that, what is probably a structural site present in the nucleus of cells, as a scaffold in which to uh, do DNA replication and transcription. So the ND10s provide an innate nuclear defense if they can keep the virus away. They epigenetically regulate virus replication, so they're not really part of the virus per se, but they control 
how the virus can elaborate RNA or DNA, prevent DNA replication by preventing access or limiting access, and the same with transcription. An important member of that family is the promyelocytic leukemia protein, PML, and that's an important constituent of ND10. And I bring that up because some herpes viruses target PML for proteolysis. So as a function of infection and limited replication of the virus genome, the protein is elaborated. In the case of herpes simplex virus, it's called ICP0. And that protein targets PML. It essentially targets it for degradation by causing it to be ubiquitinated. And then it goes into the protocell. Herpes simplex virus is very much like varicella zoster virus. So one causes cold sores, one causes sit shingles, they each go and reside in your neurons, and they come back to haunt you uh, later in life. But they do things differently. And if we look here, we can look at what their effect is on the dissolution of these PMLs. So here we have a cell infected with herpes simplex virus, and the red indicates synthesis of a protein, ICP0. And below it, we have cell infected with varicella zoster virus and the orthologous protein, or 61P. In each case, you can see that the protein is accumulating in the nucleus of the cell. So while these proteins look very much alike, they share major structural domains and a lot of amino acid homology, they do things differently. So in the case of herpes simplex virus, we don't see any PML bodies present in the nucleus of that cell. And we can demonstrate that by merging this picture with this picture and getting this overlap. And there are very few green spots. In contrast, in the cell infected with varicella zoster virus, we see lots of PML bodies, even in the presence of ORF61P. So these two viruses that are very closely related, they look alike, they have the same physical structure, they have the same genomic structure. They can, in many cases, you can take a gene from one virus, put it in the backbone of another, and substitute for it, but they don't do the same things. So one very effectively captures the host uh, ND10 innate response, and the other not so effectively. And in fact, replication of this is far more robust than this, except in people. So the question is, is the ND10 response upregulated in the effect itself? And the answer is maybe. And the answer is maybe because ND10s really are a, uh, a discrete replication factory scaffold. And they're limited in number in the cell. But some of the proteins that constitute that are upregulated. Okay. Okay, another way in which viruses can attack the host is to regulate translation. And if you think about it, when a virus gets into a cell, what it would really like to do is make more of its own proteins. And it would like the cell to favor synthesis of its own protein. And many viruses do this, and some viruses don't. If the virus elicits into if the virus elicits interferon, then it establishes the antiviral state. We get induction of protein kinase R and other EIF2 alpha kinases. So we're inhibiting initiation of translation. So what are the consequences for virus replication? Well, if the virus doesn't replicate, that is, if it doesn't translate the mRNAs that it's making, that infection will invariably fade out. So there are many different pathways in which innate defenses are triggered. And we're not going to talk about most of these. Dr. Racaniello has told you about TLRs and Rig I and PKR. And, and what we're going to talk about today is PKR and how it blocks the role of EIF2 alpha or initiation of translation. And You'll recall that PKR is activated as a consequence of binding double-stranded RNA. In response to binding double-stranded RNA, it autophosphorylates itself on a serine residue. And that phosphorylated molecule is the one that's active. 
And when it's PKR is phosphorylated, you don't get phosphorylation of EIF. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. You get phosphorylation of EIF2, and that forms a very tight ternary complex with GDP EIF2B. And instead of being um, released and put into the translational machinery, it gets blocked. So it blocks recycling, and translation is arrested. We can see that on the next diagram. Oops, sorry. Two diagrams. Up. So how does the virus counteract PKR? <laughs> virus proteins have evolved many different ways to thwart the host antivirus response. And there's a protein that's elaborated by herpes simplex virus called US11, again, a protein. It blocks PKR activation by binding to it. The adenovirus VARNAs, RNA versus protein, bind tightly to PKR, and that results in a double-stranded RNA decoy. And a protein elaborated by human papillomaviruses and another herpes simplex virus protein result in dephosphorylation of the IF. Alpha. When EIF, EIF2 alpha is dephosphorylated, it doesn't participate in the initiation of protein synthesis. And we know how this works. This protein, it interacts with protein phosphatase 1A, and it redirects it to EIF2 alpha to remove that phosphate group. So <clears throat> you'll recall from Dr. Racaniello's lecture that phosphorylation of EIF2 uh, alpha results in a uh, complex with GEP, and then you have a, um, a, pyro, a phosphate exchange reaction, which releases EIF2B, and we can then enter the translation site. Herpes simplex virus US11 and adenovirus VARNAs block activation PKR by binding to it. So that's one step in the process. And these two proteins, the papillomavirus protein, and the other herpes simplex virus protein result in either def uh, dephosphorylation of this protein and as a result, <coughs> excuse me, um, result, result in the establishment of phosphorylate, phosphorylated EIF2 alpha and GDP in the complex with EIF2B and as a result translation is inhibited because EIF2B is never released from Complex. So viruses can modulate interferon production in many different ways. They can prevent transcription of interferons. They can inhibit interferon synthesis of both at the transcriptional level and the translational level. I've told you before that they make interferon receptor decoys. If you have a receptor that's out in um, the serum circulating, an interferon comes along and you can gobble it up, you can prevent the interferon from uh, completing its mission. You can prevent signaling, and you can prevent uh, stimulation of interferon simulated genes. Another way in which cells respond to virus infection and infections of all kinds is through autophagy. And you've probably learned that this is a catabolic process, so the cell is destroyed in the process of doing it. It involves degradation of a cell's own components, so it's sacrificing itself on the doorpost of infection so that other cells will not be infected. And what happens is this works through the lysosomal machinery. And what we look at is, in response to some activator, a cell protein in particular called Becklin-1, which is responsible for activating autophagy, you get isolation of membranes. And these membranes become vesicles, and they begin to elongate in response to a whole host of factors. And these are a large number of uh, host genes. One which is particularly important is a protein called LC3. And we'll look at its role in just a second. After you uh, get these vesicles elongated, they begin to fill with proteins that are present in the cell, and they form these autophagosomes. Autophagosomes contain host proteins that are in the process of being broken down, but that's stimulated in response to the fusion of a lysosome with the autophagosome, and that's where LC3 comes in. LC3 is required 
to form this autolysosome. So the autolysosome is a fusion of an autophagosome with a lysosome, and as a consequence of that, host proteins are rapidly degraded. What does this all look like? So we, here we have our isolated membrane, becomes autophagosome, fuses with the lysosome. So here is the autolysosome, here is the autophagosome, and this product is the result of fusion of the autophagosome with the lysosome, uh, excuse me, this product. And you can see inside of the autolysosome that there's a lot of very dense material. And that dense staining material is a result of breakdown of protein. Now, what's required? How does a virus fight this? We have three panels here, and I'd like to go through them in a little detail. And the purpose of this is to show what happens to LC3, which is a marker of, auto of autophagy. So in the green, in the first panel, we have cells to which GFP has been fused to LC3. And you can see, after a mock infection, that LC3 is all over the cell at four hours, at eight hours, and at 24 hours. And it's not perturbed in any way. In response to human cytomegalovirus, by four hours post-infection, LC3 begins to increase in density. And you see this as punctate granules. So here we see these punctate granules. And then it continues. At eight hours, there's more of it. But by 24 hours, it begins to dissipate. So first it's stimulated, and then it's turned off. If you infect cells with ultraviolet light irradiated human cytomegalovirus, so that the DNA is damaged, and the virus cannot transcribe genetic information efficiently, then we see very little change in the distribution of LC3 as a function of infection. And we see very little synthesis of PP65 in these cells that have LC3. So what does that tell you? It tells you that during the course of a normal infection, autophagy is first stimulated and then repressed. But that this stimulation and repression requires elaboration of a virus protein because in UV irradiated virus, we fail to see any um, evidence of autophagy being stimulated. What's, uh, <clears throat> what's the protein that's responsible for it? It's a virus protein called TRS1, which stands for terminal repeat short one. Please don't learn that. And it's an inhibitor, but it's an inhibitor of a lot of things. It's an interesting protein in that it has a domain, a double-stranded RNA binding domain, and it has a PKR binding domain. So this one protein is doing the two things that I spoke to you about um, a couple of slides ago in terms of binding RNA and binding PKR. That inhibits the innate immune response. But that's not what's responsible for autophagy. It has another domain in it, and it's amino terminus, that interacts with and sequesters Becklin. And Becklin is the initiator of autophagy. And if you sequester that, then what you do is you inhibit autophagy. OK, so what is apoptosis? This is a process not unlike autophagy, um, a little bit different. If we have a normal cell in response to something that leads to cell death, such as a virus coming in and triggering um, various processes within the cell, we get the elaboration of things called cysteine proteases, or caspases. And these caspases induce cytokines. Cytokines are responsible for everything. And infected cells release proteins that are subsequently presented by MHC2. And this is an important point to get. So a cell begins to apoptose. It gathers these apoptotic bodies, which have viral proteins in them. They get gobbled up by macrophages, and these proteins come in to the cell, and they get digested by endosomes and lysosomes, and ultimately presented on the surface of cells by major histocompatibility complex too. And this results in the activation of CD8-positive cytotoxic T-cells. 
Like autophagy, it's a catabolic process. It involves degradation of the cell's own proteins, along with whatever else is pro present through the lysosomal machinery. So these are shared properties between autophagy and apoptosis. The host controls induction and suppression. And it does it because it has proteins that are anti-apoptotic, that is, proteins that are present in a cell whose purpose is to prevent uh, translocation of mitochondrial proteins. And one of these proteins is BCL. And when that's present and predominant, then it stops or arrests apoptosis. That's a good thing for the virus. Bad thing for the cell, good thing for the virus. And it's important because if the cell is apoptosing, again, the virus is now in a milieu where it's difficult for it to replicate, difficult for it to make many progeny because the cell is falling apart. There are also pro-apoptotic proteins called Bax and BAD, and they cause induction of the caspase cascade, and they release mitochondrial cytochrome C, which is one of the initiating molecules for um, beginning apoptosis. I showed you in the previous diagram that cell organelles are dismantled, vesicles form, and membrane split. I'll show you the pictures of that in a bit. Another consequence is that cellular DNA is cleaved, and you get the formation of what are like nucleosome-like ladders. That is, there are regular arrays of DNA that form within these cells because of the release of endonucleases. And new proteins and molecules appear on the surface of cells. One is called phosphatidylserine, and one is called inexin. And those are used as diagnostic markers of apoptosis. So let's go back to our diagram and recall that when a virus enters a cell, sometimes it perturbs the cell cycle. And when you perturb the cell cycle and the gatekeepers that form uh, in response to um, regular cell division, then what happens is apoptosis is activated. Cells fall apart, and the virus fails to complete the replication cycle. It's incumbent on the virus to block this and complete its replication cycle. So here's a picture of cells infected with a virus. It happens to be a herpes simplex virus from which a gene has been deleted. That gene encodes a protein called ICP27, and it happens to be an immediate early gene, one that is made very, very early in the course of the infectious cycle. If you delete that, then you can watch the cells round up, and if you look very carefully, you see that there are these little blebs that form around the rounded cells. And these are diagnostic of apoptosis. And if you look more carefully at a much enlarged picture of an apoptotic cell, you'll see the formation of these membrane blebs, which indicate that the cell is falling apart. If you look at the DNA in the cell, and this is done by doing something called um, gel electrophoresis, where DNA is loaded into a well at the top, and it's electrophoresis down. And you can see a noted difference between cells in which the virus mutant, uh, cells infected with the virus mutant, or cells infected with the wild type virus. So in cells infected with, <clears throat> the, uh, with the virus mutant, we see that apoptosis occurred. We get the regular laddering of DNA. And this represents DNA being degraded by the host in response to the virus infection. So the purpose of this virus gene, ICP27, is to prevent DNA fragmentation. Why? Because it's not clear that the host would really differentiate between the virus DNA and its own DNA. So it would just go on a rampant rage and attempt to de degrade all the DNA that it finds. So why block um, apoptosis? I think it's pretty clear. Cells that are infected or frequently induced to activate quiescent cell machinery. So we talked about um, SC40 virus and how it doesn't encode a lot of genes. What it does is it turns the host on and it gets around the host checkpoints. So now that cell is activated. But the cell senses that. When cell um, control proteins, that is, uh, are the checkpoint proteins are synthesized at the wrong time, or destroy, the cell knows that. And in response to that, it can initiate the apoptosis. The virus responds in kind because it needs to complete its replication cycle. 
if you fail to replicate the normal amount, you don't accumulate the normal amount of virus. You can't infect the neighboring cell, and the virus infection is ameliorated. It also inhibits the release of virus antigens. Why? Because a virus wants to hide. It doesn't want the host to know that it's there. And if you block the release of these vesicles that are full of virus protein, then the host scavenger cells, the macrophages and whatnot, don't see them. And you eliminate a T cell response which will come in, recognize the infected cell, and kill it. So two major purposes for blocking apoptosis. Evade the immune response and replicate the virus. How do you block it? Well, here are some examples. And human cytomegalovirus, which seems to contain a protein to do everything you can possibly think about, encodes and not <coughs> transcribes a non-coding RNA that binds a mitochondrial protein that triggers apoptosis. So by binding to this protein, it prevents the cell from responding. Adenovirus elaborates an early protein that binds facts, and that prevents caspase activation. That's called intrinsic activation. So it's something that occurs from inside the cell. Cells also have a series of proteins on their surface that are called death receptors. And they're called death receptors because when they recognize their ligand, which is fast, then they induce apoptosis. So that's extrinsic um, activation of apoptosis. So you can block it from inside, and you can block it from outside. Um, <clears throat> another interesting story involves human immunodeficiency virus and how it invades the rig eye in the you would think that a virus comes in, it begins to replicate its genome, it elaborates some RNAs, that this would be an effective way for the host um, <clears throat> to knock out HIV. For many reasons, it turns out that that's not really true. But what happens is that um, what HIV does is avoid this. And it avoids this in a very interesting fashion. It avoids it because it elaborates a protein called protease. And you would think that the protease is a molecule that disrupts and destroys rig eye. But in fact, if you look in a cell that's infected with a GFP labeled protease, then you see that um, the GFP protease and rig eye both go to the same site in the cell. LAMP1 happens to be a protein um, which is indicative of lysosomes. And what happens is in the presence of HIV protease, rig eye now forms around uh, the nucleus of cells in these LAMP1 molecules. So rig eye goes from being cytoplasmic here in the uninfected cell, these are, this is just a GFP molecule by itself, to being mostly nuclear in these very functive uh, bodies. So the thought was, well, the protease is doing it. It's driving this rig eye from the cytoplasm into these lysosomes where it'll be digested. So an experiment was done with an inhibitor protease, sakinavir. And what happens when cells were infected with this GFP protease in the presence of this viral protease inhibitor. And surprisingly, the same effect occurred. Rig I was located in the nuclear space in lysosomes and uh, present where LAMP1 associates. So what's the take-home message from this? The take-home message from this is that Protease is required to inhibit rig eye, but it doesn't do it by proteolizing the molecule. Rather, it binds to it and brings it into uh, these lysosomal bodies. And perhaps you've heard of another um, family of proteins called the apobex proteins. And apobex are editing molecules. They edit RNA. And their uh, function as interferon-stimulated genes is to deaminate cytidine to uracil. And this is an intrinsic antiviral. And what it does is it blocks replication of HIV, hepatitis B virus, and measles viruses, and probably some others. Curiously, it's incorporated into HIV virus particles. 
And so you think to yourself, is the host one step ahead of the virus? You know the answer to that. The host is never one step ahead. Um, how does APOPEC inhibit HIV replication? Well, it turns out that it takes the cytidine molecules, deoxycytidines, in minus-stranded DNA. That's the first step in replicating HIV. And it turns it into uracil, uridine. <clears throat> this results in transitions, and it's changing from the GC-based pairs to AT-based pairs. And so you have codons that encoded tryptophan becoming stop codons. So you have protein synthesis, which is stopped as a result of the introduction of stop codons. It also, because uridine is not normally incorporated in DNA, that DNA is attacked by a host <coughs> uracil DNA glycosidase. And this generates a basic site. So you have no base in the place. And you have a phosphodiester bond, and it becomes a target for endonuclease. And you get single-stranded breaks in DNA. So you fail to make the molecule that gets integrated into the host. So how does HIV survive? Very nicely. And it does it because it elaborates a protein called VIF. And VIF is one of the many <coughs> proteins that Racaniello will tell you about, which is incorporated into the virion. And VIF acts in a species-specific manner. <coughs> it's very important to understand. Many of the times we study viruses in different hosts, we study closely related viruses, like the simian immunodeficiency virus. And it turns out that monkeys survive quite well in And they have many different ways of inhibiting virus replication. But the human VIF will not function well in a primate and vice versa. So these species-specific binding to APOBEC and targets it to the proteasome. So the proteasome is a common theme for the course of this discussion because proteasome is a <coughs> place itself where viral proteins get torn apart, host proteins get torn apart, depending upon who's being. So let's move on to a little more complicated. And that's the human role for the cell immune uh, pathways. And we recognize that infection of the vertebrate results in either a humoral response, activation of these cells for the purpose of making the antibody, or a cell mediated response, which for the purposes of uh, today's discussion is going to be activation of native. T cells come in two flavors, either CD4 positive T cells, so they have this uh, cytoplasmic protein CD4, or CD8 positive T cells, which have a CD8 molecule. Each of them has a T cell receptor. So the T cell receptor is present on these cells along with either a CD4 or a CD8 molecule. In response <coughs> to uh, presentation of proteins, these cells then get activated. The TB4 uh, cells tend to be mostly T helper cell precursors, and the CD8 positive cells are cytotoxic T helper cells. When CD4 helper cells are activated, they can elaborate either TH1 cytokines, so that's a TH1 cell response, and the TH1 cell response and the cytokines stimulate CD8 positive. TH2 response results in stimulation of B cells and the development of plasma cells which secrete antibodies. In each case, these responses activate cells, and the activated cells clonally expand. They clonally expand because they go to a place which encourages this kind of uh, replication. And as a result, you get a robust antibody response or T cell, a T cell mediated response. In either case, you're looking at the ability of the molecule or cell to recognize the infected cells and kill them. So, if you look at the cell surface of the CD4 <coughs> alpha cell, you see that it recognizes its T cell receptor in collaboration with CD4, recognizes peptides in the context of what's called 
MHC class 2. MHC2 is a molecule that contains an alpha and a beta chain, both of which terminate um, through the well, go through the memory of the cell. But TCR recognizes peptide containing MHC2. In the case of CD8 expressing cell, everything's the same except for the CD8 molecule. And as a result of that, the TCR now recognizes peptides that are presented through MHC class 1 which is uh, an MHC molecule and another molecule called beta-2 microglobin. In either case, recognition of these molecules leads to T-cell activation. So let's just look again. Here's our antigen presenting cell. So this is a cell that's infected. And in this case, it's elaborating proteins from the incoming virus. So they're presented by class 2, which results in stimulation native CD4 cell and CD4 T cell activation. CD4 cells can become many different kinds of CD4 positive T cells. But I'd like to emphasize their role as the GH1 cell, which is the predominant response. And that response is the result of elaboration of different kinds of cytokines, predominantly IF-12, the type 1 is the neuron, where they can become GH2 cells in response to IL. In either case, these cells all release different effector cytokines, and the effector T cells migrate to the effector tissue for the purpose of killing the infected cell. In the case, <coughs> in the case of Th1 cells, we now have antigen-presenting cells that can present antigen in two different ways. This is a little bit of a misrepresentation. We can have antigen coming in from infected cells, in which case, excuse me, virus, in which case that presents as MHC2, or it can be because the protein is produced in the cell, and the infected cell now takes that protein, puts it into a proteasome, where that protein gets digested. So that's the host responding to the virus protein. And that virus protein gets put onto the surface of the cell, and I'll show you that in a bit. In response to the Th1 positive cell, the CD8 positive cell is now activated because IL2 is produced. Cells proliferate, they generate cytotoxic CD8 positive cells, and they recognize virus infected cells. In response to the Th2 cell, cell cytokines are released to B cells that are elaborating um, <clears throat> infected molecules. And this results in stimulation of B cells. And these stimulated B cells, or the activated B cells, go to germinal centers where they are amplified in response to the virus infection. And that produces neutralizing antibodies. So the important things to take home lessons. Clonal expansion occurs, and that's the increase in the number of cell responders. T cells kill cells bearing foreign peptide or protein. If they're CD4 positive, they recognize peptides bounded by MHC2. If they're CD8 positive, then they recognize MHC1 bound peptides. And all this occurs in response to cytokines from Th1 cells for CD8s, and then they become mature CTLs, and other cytokines from uh, Th2 cells, which affect the activation of B cells. And in each case, we can gener generate a memory cell, a memory B cell or a memory T cell. And you effectively then get a rapid secondary T cell response if you get infected again, or the rapid production of antibody, the anamnestic response. So <clears throat> the adaptive immune system has a humoral component and a cell-mediated component. The humoral component produces antibody. The cell-mediated component is involved in presentation and recognition of antigen on all cells. And antigen presented by MHC2 on macrophages or dendritic cells. So there are many different ways of activating a T cell. And um, as a consequence of this, there are many different T cells that form. Dendritic cells are scavenger cells. They are probably the primary component for activating the immune response, 
and we believe that they are probably um, the gate that controls how the immune response um, is affected. And viruses have a number of ways of suppressing their activity. They can interfere with the recruitment of dendritic cells. So as cell necrosis begins, dendritic cells and macrophages are brought to the site of cell necrosis. And viruses can hide that activity. They can impair antigen uptake or processing so that the dendritic cells are now not free to present antigen. They can interfere with the maturation of the dendritic cell so that it doesn't, so it will take up antigen but not go anywhere. And that results in the inability of these dendritic cells to migrate to lymphoid tissue where they present antigen to naive T cells. And if you don't get there, then you fail to activate T cells. So viruses have a bunch of different ways in which they can effectively knock out the dendritic cell response. They also have ways of inhibiting directly the T cell response. So Epstein-Barr virus, a large herpes virus that infects 85% of you, encodes a homologue of IL-10. And IL-10 is a cytokine that suppresses the Th1 response. Suppress the Th1 response, and then you suppress elaboration of that cytokine. And as a result, EBV goes undetected in the infected individual. Kaposi's sarcoma herpes virus elaborates a horde of viral kinds. And these are cyt the cytokine memetics that I spoke about at the beginning of the lecture. And these are probably all genes that were captured from the, ho <coughs> excuse me, from the host. But they also provide a refuge from immune surveillance because it appears as though uh, the cell is not infected to the host. Now, one of the interesting cells in the T cell family is the natural killer cell. Natural killer cells have no antigen receptor. They secrete cytokines. They kill cells that lack MHC1. So if an infected cell does not have MHC1 on the surface, then the NK cell recognizes this as missing cell. So it has an activating molecule that is, um, <coughs> excuse me, it has an inhibitory receptor that when bound to an MHC1 molecule prevents the NK cell from killing the cell. Let's skip this for a second. Now what happens in an infected cell? So here's our NK cell on the right, and here's our infected cell on the left. There are viral mimetics, which when placed on the surface of the cell, will actually present peptide to an NK cell. If an NK cell sees this viral mimetic, the homolog, with a protein, then it activates the inhibitory receptor. So the, in, the NK cell doesn't kill. There are many more inhibitory receptors than activated receptors. And that helps to keep things in check. They only have to hit one receptor molecule in a cell for it to effectively inhibit activation. Viruses also downregulate expression of host MHC1. But as a consequence of that, other host molecules are present. And they can still interact with the MHC1 uh, inhibitory receptor. So that's two ways of effectively knocking out or um, engaging the inhibitory receptor and preventing the NK cell from recognizing the fact that the cell was infected. They can also block activating proteins, either by directly inhibiting transcription, so the activating ligand is not present on the surface of the cell. They can um, <clears throat> elaborate activating receptor antagonists that bind to the activating receptor. And this goes back to what I told you before. These molecules that are virus in nature come out from the infected cell. They sit in the pocket of the activating receptor, but they don't stimulate the NK cell to actively begin its process. Or they can release cytokine or chemokine binding proteins. And these occur um, at the surface of the cells, and they gather up the cytokines that are normally uh, released and would stimulate an NK cell and prevent it from being activated. Cytokine and or chemokine antagonists are also made. 
these again will sit in the receptor for a cytokine, preventing activation. And finally, viruses have the unusual ability to sit in some of these inhibitory receptors and block a response, or just directly infect an NK cell and kill it. So these are five major pathways in which a virus, as a result of its re <coughs> replication machinery, can block activation of NK cells. So we have MHC1 homologs. We have molecules that regulate presentation of M MHC1. We have release of viral receptors, and that blocks engagement with the activating molecule, preventing the function of the NK cell. We have antagonists of activating receptors, or you can just go ahead and kill the cell and prevent it from doing its thing. Some of the proteins that do this are protein from hepatitis C virus that binds one of the activator molecules, activator receptors, on the surface of NK cells. And as a result, the infected cell is not recognized. HIV elaborates a protein called NEF that affects cell surface expression of some MHC1 molecules, but not this molecule, molecule HLAE, so the cell is still protected. And pox viruses express proteins that bind IL-12. And as a result of that, you inhibit interferon gamma production by NK cell. So you prevent that response by the NK cell, uh, which results from having recognized presentation of virus uh, antigen. So two pathways that you should be familiar with are the presentation of antigen by MHC class 2. Proteins come in in the form of virus. They are endocytosed. The endosome then lowers its pH and the proteins are digested in peptides. This molecule, MHC2, is composed of an alpha and a beta chain. And when it's first synthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum, it's bound by another protein called the invariant chain. As this protein goes through the Golgi apparatus, the invariant chain is degraded. And now MHC2 is available for recognizing digested peptides. They form in, they uh, enter the cleft of the MHC2 molecule, and these molecules mature through the cytoplasm, and are presented on the surface of the cell, where they can be recognized by CD4 containing T cells. MHC1 presentation is different. It occurs as a result of proteins being ubiquitinated. The ubiquitinated proteins are recognized by the proteasome, and digested into small peptides, nanomers of preferred length. And they enter the lumen of the ER through an apparatus that includes something called the transporter of antigen presentation. And this is a multi-component uh, protein component system, which takes these peptides and introduces it into the cleft of an MHC1 molecule. So MHC1, similar to MHC2, is first protected by another host protein, calnexin. And when it gets into the ER, if beta-2 microglobulin is present, calnexin is released, and we form a functional MHC class I molecule that can recognize peptide. This loaded MHC1 molecule then goes through the Golgi apparatus, maturing and getting decorated <coughs> with various glycoproteins, and then gets transported to the surface of the cell, where a CD8 cell will recognize peptide in the context of MHC1. So we have MHC2 presentation and MHC1 presentation. Viral proteins can interfere with MHC-mediated antigen pre presentation. And how many targets are there? Well, there are as many targets as there are steps in the generation of MHC1 molecules and their presentation of antigen. And you can see that every step in the pathway of MHC1 presentation, for every step, there is a virus protein that interferes. So there's a protein elaborated by herpes simplex virus that blocks entry into the ER. Human cytomegalovirus has a protein, and this is an ATP-dependent uh, process, by the way, the herpes simplex virus process. Human cytomegalovirus has a protein that blocks the ATPase. 
Epstein Barr virus has a single protein that does both of these things. It blocks entry and it blocks uh, turnover of ATP. You can block maturation of MHC1 and force it from going from the trans Golgi to the surface and kick it back out into the cytoplasm where it's degraded. We have virus proteins that will phosphorylate the proteasome and prevent it from degrading proteins. And we have molecules such as E1A from adenovirus and human immunodeficiency virus protein, TAC, that prevent <coughs> transcription of the MHC1 uh, uh, gene. As a result, no new protein is made. And it turns out that these virus molecules have been extremely important in identifying the pathway to MHC1 presentation. And some of the virus molecules made by cytomegalovirus, which is a virus that replicates very slowly. And because, or we think because it replicates very slowly, it has to have multiple ways of affecting the MHC presentation pathway. So it can inhibit the proteasome, it can inhibit MHC1 translocation to the ER, or transport across the ER, it can take MHC1 that's in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the ER and force it back out into the cytoplasm. When it's back out into the cytoplasm, it's no longer protected by the Golgi apparatus, and it gets degraded. And finally, we have this protein, UL18, which is an MHC1 mimetic that's thought to downregulate both NK cells and CTLs. So, in summary, viruses have a way to cope with their hosts. For the host to succeed, viral antigens must be presented on the cell surface. If the virus can find a way to modulate antigenic presentation, then it can effectively interfere with the host's ability to recognize the virus and the infected cells. Viruses have many points of intercession, and they have defined how MHC1 presents antigen. So if you can recite these various different ways in which the immune system is modulated and understand how we have secreted modulators, virokines, viroreceptors. We have modulators that affect the infected cell surface. We have modulators that hide the infected cell. I haven't discussed antigenic hypervariability, but Dr. Rachniel will tell you about that in his lecture on evolution. We have ways to bypass or kill lymphocytes. I guess I shouldn't use the we, I'm not a virus. Uh, we can block the adaptive immune response. There are ways to inhibit the complement, modulate apoptosis. Don't present any antigens. If the cell dies, the virus doesn't survive. If the cell lives, the virus survives. We can modulate autophagy. And we can interfere with pattern recognition receptors. Thank you.